It was, uh, I want to say, begin by saying thank you to Dennis Landa and the team who have put the, together this conference. I'm very excited about this widened focus of including companies and NGOs and so on like that in our Global Connections Conference. It is a way of walking out our talk that all people are kingdom builders. So here it is. Welcome, kingdom builders. We have work to do ahead of us. It was also one year ago in this conference that we had our last major illegal gathering. Yes, I know. <laughs> we were all together in the gym and looking at each other. Are you going to infect me or are you going to infect me? It turns out only four people ended up picking it up. And we didn't have any broad transmission, even though schools are considered, colleges especially, are considered super spreader environments. So thank you all for putting up with all this stuff. And we had compliments from AHS last week on how we have done in uh, executing or in keeping our school open, but also not having it, it uh, get out of control and super spread around. So as we worked on the thought of what to have for a theme for this conference, um, we thought this idea of on the move was a very good one. We sort of had this idea of Aslan waking up and growling and getting on the move. And then I remembered a, a quote from Dallas Willard uh, just before he passed away, a brilliant theologian and philosopher who said, um, I have great hope. This was just before he passed away. I have great hope for the church because it appears that the Holy Spirit has decided to move. And that seems to be true in our time. So today, this year, we were able to get this friend of mine, Ramez Atala, to come and, and speak. Um, and I, I hope you're online, Ramez, or at least I hope you're hearing my appreciation and feeling my love for you as you work there continuing in Egypt. But here's a brief bio on Ramez, my friend. I told you a little bit about him on Monday, so I won't repeat that. But an Egyptian by birth... Ramez emigrated as a teenager to Canada, where he met the Lord and was discipled by InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at McGill University. During the 70s, he led the InterVarsity, Christ InterVarsity English student ministry in Quebec and pioneered the French student ministry. In 1980, he returned to Egypt with his wife, Rebecca, and MK from Haiti, and their two children. During the 1980s, he headed up the InterVarsity student ministry in the Middle East. His passion for inductive Bible study, something that we actually practice out in our classes in those seven Old Testament, three New Testament uh, courses. Uh, his passion for inductive Bible study eventually led him in 1990 to become the CEO of Bible Society of Egypt, which is the largest publisher of Arabic Bibles in the world and is, created, and is creatively promoting Bible engagement through every possible means. I believe that Ramez is God's general in Egypt. Since the 1974 Lausanne Congress in world, on World Evangelism, he has been actively involved in a variety of ways with the Lausanne movement. He was the program chairman for the Lausanne 3 Cape Town Congress in 2010. I'm going to read a passage that Ramez asked if, if we would read just before he speaks, and then I'm going to pray and we'll play his message. I'm reading from Genesis chapter 11, ah, chapter, sorry, what is it? Yeah, yeah, chapter 45, verses 1 to 11, different 11, there it is. Genesis chapter 45, if you want to turn in your, pass, in your uh, Bibles, it is, uh, I'm using the NIV. In fact, I think it might also be on, on camera, so there we are. The setting here is Joseph is in his house and his brothers have been caught having uh, left town with his silver uh, cup, and uh, he, they're back with him. And Joseph now realizes it's time to tell his brothers who he is. So this is a very monumental point in his life, in the reunion of his family. It's a, just a really, really excellent passage that Ramez is going to be speaking on. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, "'Have everyone leave my presence.'" So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. 
Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been a famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and no reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and be near me. You, your children, your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there. Because five years of famine will still, are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. Let me pray and then we'll get on with the message. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the way you have moved through history, and I thank you for the way that you are moving now through your Holy Spirit on the face of the earth. We ask that you would grant us the privilege of being part of the work you are doing. So move now in us that we would move on for you and be a blessing in your name. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I had really hoped to be able to be with you for this exciting event, GCC 2021, the career fair for kingdom builders. Um, but uh, as you know, I wasn't able to come and give you greetings from Egypt. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you today and tomorrow. Our topic is principles for kingdom builders. And today we're going to speak about Joseph, and tomorrow we're going to speak about Paul. Joseph was an unlikely kingdom builder. The last chapters of Genesis are, relate his story, a remarkable story, an unbelievable story of a person whom God used in remarkable ways. But he didn't begin that way. He was a spoiled child, and nobody expected him to be the person he ended up being, especially in the largest country in the world, the most powerful country in the world, the then world, Egypt. The theme of our talk today is to excel in whatever you do, which is what God helped Joseph to do. Now, if it was in our day, I'm sure Netflix would have thought of having a series on Joseph. Episode one could be focusing on him, a spoiled childhood. You could call it unjustly favored favorite son of his father um, and the youngest for, uh, at that time. Episode two, he was slave of Potiphar. It could focus on being unjustly sold. Episode three, he was a prisoner in jail, unjustly charged. And episode four, ruler of Egypt, miraculously appointed. But one of the remarkable things in the story of Joseph is wherever he was, he made the best of every situation. When he was a slave, the Bible tells us Joseph found favor in his eyes, that is the eyes of Potiphar, his owner, and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Everything was entrusted to the slave. He must have really been able to prove himself to Potiphar. And then he was unjustly imprisoned. And the keeper of a prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. I'm sure this didn't happen overnight. He must have proved himself. All the prisoners who were in the prison, whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. And then Pharaoh, in a remarkable turn of events, appointed him as the ruler of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up a hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And this was quite remarkable, a very remarkable uh, rise in power 
but it was based on the fact that wherever he was, he made the best of every situation. Now, in each of his situations, it wasn't just his effort, it wasn't just his gift, it wasn't just his charisma or his faithfulness. It was that the Lord was with him in every step. That's what the Bible says. What a blessing to believe that God is with you in everywhere you go, even in places you hate, even in circumstances you don't like, even in times you feel you're wasting your time. In Potiphar's home, as a slave, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. In jail, where he was unjustly jailed, it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. God's steadfast love was poured on Joseph in jail, in difficult circumstances. In the jail, some of you, as younger people are failing, whether it's the, your home situation, your study situation, your financial jail, whatever it is, what you need is God's steadfast love. And he can pour it to you if you turn to him. And then as a ruler, Joseph answered Pharaoh. He didn't say, I have a gift, I can do it. He said, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. So Joseph depended on God in every situation, and God was with him, an important principle for our lives. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord can show his steadfast love to you in any circumstance you find yourself in? That was the great blessing that Joseph experienced. Now, the Lord also blessed this work. Uh, he rewarded um, Joseph's faithfulness by blessing everything he did. In Potiphar's house, it says, from the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Can you believe it? God blessed Potiphar because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. What a blessing it would be if we are blessed that way, wherever we are, and that the Lord can bless whatever we do, wherever we are, because of our relationship with him. The jailer felt the same thing. The keeper of a prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. So often people complain of their teachers, of their bosses at work, or people who are above them, their parents. But you know, if they serve the Lord faithfully, and if the Lord blesses them in their work, they will be trusted by whoever is in charge of them, and they'll have freedom to continue enjoying what they do in spite of the difficulties. And finally, with Pharaoh, Joseph stored up grain in so great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. What a blessing he was to the whole land of Egypt. What would you have done with Joseph if you were God? What would your plans have been for him? Could you have given Joseph miraculous gifts to impress the Egyptians like Moses? Would you have sent him on a preaching tour of Egypt like Jonah? Would you have had him build a temple like Solomon to compete with all the Egyptian temples? That would have been a good plan. Send Joseph to Egypt and have him do miraculous gifts, preach, and build a temple to worship the Lord. That's what some of us would think would be the right plan. But what did God really do with him? He made of him, when he reached Pharaoh's palace, a government official. That is, he got him involved in politics. He made him specialized in agricultural reform that changed the economics and protected the economics of Egypt the economy of Egypt and the nations around. He taught him warehousing skills and principles. He made him a brilliant manager to store that incredible amount of uh, wheat and, uh, for, the, for seven years so that it would carry on for the seven years of famine. He made of him a national leader, the administrator of the largest and most powerful nation in the world. That little spoiled kid from his, from his home um, under Jacob became the administrator of all of Egypt. And he ended up controlling the fate of nations and neighboring peoples. He was the ruler of Egypt. 
politics, economics, management, uh, doesn't seem like what God wants to make out of missionaries who would impact the whole country of Egypt. What God decides for you is not always what you want, but it's for your best. Joseph lost everything when he left Jacob's home as the favored son and became a prisoner in Egypt. Um, he was completely devastated. As a slave, he barely made it, but he succeeded. And then when he was at the pinnacle of his success, he lost it all. So many of us find life's situations hard and difficult to cope with. The secret is, is God with you, as he was with Joseph in every single situation. When I was 16, my family lost all they owned in Egypt. It was a time of a socialist government that decided that being rich was a crime, even if you were honest. And my grandfather, who was one of the richest men in the nation, lost everything, his companies, his money, everything. And he escaped to Canada. And slowly after that, we joined him in Montreal, devastated, penniless, lost. And he died shortly after that, and we were left all alone. It seemed like a disaster. It seemed like it was the wrong plan. But God used that for his glory. And in spite of all the difficulties, I can look back now and see that God had his plan, a plan that I would never have conceived for myself, but that worked out for the best. What about you? What about your circumstances? Why are you here at Prairie? What are you looking forward to? You also may be in a situation where you're not quite sure what you're going to do or where God is going to lead you. And as you look at the story of Joseph, it may encourage you to know that God is with you. If God be for us, the Bible says, who can be against us? That's the most important thing. Not what you're doing, not how successful you are, but that God is with you, as he was with this lonely boy, Joseph, in Egypt, and me as a lonely, lost international student in Montreal many, many years ago. Now, how did God prepare Joseph for this mission? It wasn't just all of a sudden that Joseph became uh, the ruler of Egypt. He was trained. His early dreams got him in trouble at home. And he probably cursed the day he told his parents about the dream because it got him so much trouble. Eventually, actually, it nearly got him killed by his brothers. But his gift in interpreting dreams later saved him and the whole world from famine. Now he learned business from his father Jacob, who was grooming him to be his heir, even though he wasn't the, the oldest son. Jacob loved him more than the others and must have seen in him administrative skills and abilities that he didn't see in his brothers. So there was potential for him that way, but it was unrealized potential. And finally, he learned Egyptian management from Potiphar, who was extremely gifted as one of the officials of Pharaoh. They, Joseph couldn't have gone from being a shepherd boy in, uh, in Israel to, to Egypt as a manager of the country, managing the incredible task of controlling all the, um, the food resources of Egypt. His, he learned Egyptian management skills and approaches and methods in Potiphar's house as a slave, and he excelled in them, so that Potiphar made him in charge of all his household. And following that, Pharaoh did the same. He made him in charge of all of Egypt. And in jail, now why jail? What could he have possibly learned in jail? What about these hard years where he felt completely abandoned? He had lived up to his moral commitment to God to not sin. He rejected, resisted Potiphar's wife's sexual advances. And they were multiple, the text tells us. Which young man would have the courage and the strength to resist such temptation? When a woman offers herself to him and insists on him uh, having sexual relations with her, he resisted. And for that, instead of being rewarded, he was sent to jail. What a disaster. What a catastrophe. 
But what did he learn in jail? He learned how enemies of a state operate. And that helped him very much, I'm sure, when he was in charge of Egypt, to know how to cope with enemies he had within the state who could have caused disaster to him, people jealous of him, people against him. He knew how they operated him, how they operated as no one else knew. No other person probably working in Pharaoh's entourage in, with a group of Pharaoh's leaders had been in jail and had known how criminals think. How would you think God is preparing you for the mission he has in store for your future? This is a good time to begin reflecting on that and to think of what he wants of you. When I was an InterVarsity student, uh, I was discipled by the group at McGill Christian Fellowship at McGill University. My life was changed. It was a tremendous, very exciting time. During those years as, as a student, I had a vision to be an InterVarsity staff worker. And upon graduation and studying in seminary, I became the InterVarsity director for the province of Quebec. In those days, we had two movements. Uh, that I was in charge of, the English InterVarsity, which had been there since the founding of InterVarsity in Canada in the 1930s, and the uh, Groupe Biblique Universitaire, the new fledgling, beginning uh, French student movement. So in both of these, we had some key people whom God used in remarkable ways. I remember Willie Cotuga, a student at the Concordia University, at that time it was called St. George Williams University, who was an engineering student who excelled in his work and in his work uh, in student government at the university. Twice in his career as a student at Concordia, he received the president's honor of being the student who contributed most to the life of the university. He was also the leader of the InterVarsity group on his campus so brought a lot of credibility to Christians at that university. When he continued in his work, he actually extended his time at university to five years instead of four, so he'd have time for his, his activities in the student association and in the InterVarsity group. God blessed him and used him. Many years later, he excelled and specialized in high-powered electricity, how to provide electricity for nations and worked in India for a very long time, providing power grids all across India. He had an impact on the nation of um, uh, India. Now Willie is retired, and he's working on a master's in counseling, and is hoping to be able to have a counseling ministry. Isn't that exciting to think that God can use you in this way, that he has a plan for your life? Another person I got to know in the French student movement was Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre came from France, and he did his PhD at the University of Sherbrooke in informatics, IT, particularly in voice recognition. He became a world expert in voice recognition and invented the first voice recognition, uh, I don't know what it is, technology, so that today a percentage of nearly every mobile soul sold in the world goes to him. It's a very, very small percentage, but still. Anyway, Jean-Pierre, um, we invited to be a speaker at one of our student conferences, French student conferences, as a university professor, to tell us how he integrated his faith with his um, uh, uh, studies. It was remarkable. A, a lecture by an, a, an expert in informatics presenting the Christian message in an IT concept. He related about recognition, the difficulty in teaching machines to recognize how God put in us the intuitive ability to recognize without much effort, and so on and so forth. It was very exciting. But one of the exciting things is that while Jean-Pierre was a professor of informatics at the University of Sherbrooke, he led five of his master's students to the Lord. One by one, they came to know Jesus because of a professor who loved the Lord and who excelled in what he did. God wants you, wherever you are, to excel in what you do. And both Willie and Jean-Pierre were examples to me of people who excelled and who then God used to be a, make an impact through their work for the gospel. You don't have to be a missionary or a, um, a pastor to be used by God. Like Joseph, like Jean-Pierre, like Willie, God can use you where you are as long as you're faithful to him and trust him to lead you.
Now, Joseph had many tests in his life, but this was the hardest one. The final test was when the family that he had decided to forget, he called his eldest son Manasseh, means forgetting. He didn't want to remember the hard time he had in his father's household. He wanted to completely forget them and never sought after them, never asked about them. He could have sent Egyptian spies to find out how his father was doing, how his brother's way, a lot of power, but he didn't do any of this. He left them in uh, their home and never asked about them. And one day, there they were in front of him. And the challenge was clear. Revenge or forgiveness. It wasn't an easy decision. It didn't happen overnight. Joseph struggled and struggled. And his answer came very slowly over many months as he kept testing them. You know the story. I won't repeat it. And his emotions kept getting in the way. The Bible records that Joseph cried and wept seven times in the book of Genesis. It was a struggle for him as he decided what to do with uh, his brothers. But finally, when Judah said that he would take Benjamin's place so that Jacob wouldn't be deprived of his favorite son, Benjamin, Joseph knew that his brothers had changed for real. One of his, what was the key to his ability to forgive? The key to his ability to really forgive was based on Joseph's understanding of God's sovereignty. So you see, sometimes you need to think carefully of how to forgive people who do harm to you. It doesn't come quickly. It shouldn't be superficial. It was very deep. It took a long time. It took years for Joseph to forgive his brothers. But the key was the following. The key was that in the text it says God, he, that he understood God's sovereignty so that he could tell his brothers, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here. It was not you who did the evil. God was doing good through it. It was not you who sent me here, but God. As far as you're concerned, David said at the end of uh, the book of Genesis, when his father had died and when his brothers were very worried that he would take revenge on them, he said, as far as you're concerned, you were planning evil against me, but God intended it for good, planning to bring about the present result so that many people would be preserved alive. As I said in the beginning of my talk, we're focusing today and tomorrow on principles for kingdom builders, principles that will help you as God uses you to build his kingdom. Now, the first principle is that God wants to use you where you are, wherever you are. God used Joseph wherever he was to be a blessing. Now, many young people say, where does God want me to go? What is his will for me? How can I discern God's will? And in most cases, God's will begins by where you are now. You're a student at Prairie, and that's God's will for you. And if you don't excel at Prairie, both in your studies and in your contribution to the college, God won't be able to use you to excel in his kingdom building. So begin where you are. Don't yearn for something else, but start where you are and ask him to help you. He can use every experience you go through, good or bad, to equip you for future service, if you cooperate with him. As I told you, I came as a foreign student to Canada, discipled by the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, but knowing nothing about the real world. My father told me, first year I went to university, he said, look, uh, our income is very small, we, you can live with us, we'll feed you and <laughs> have a place to sleep, but we can't pay for your university uh, fees. So you have to find a summer job. I was 17 years old, I knew nothing. I was a spoiled rich kid from Egypt. We had seven servants in our household in Egypt and I was an only child until my, daughter, my sister was born nine years later. So I was a completely spoiled kid who knew absolutely nothing. How on earth could I make money enough to pay for my student fees? I was confused, prayed about it, and met a young man who talked, told me about the Fresh Air Home, a home for underprivileged mothers and their children in Montreal, run by the Montreal Star. And he said they look for a chaplain every year to run the office and do the spiritual work at the camp. Now, I had preached my first sermon a week before, 
at the local church where I'd come to know the Lord. I was the youngest person they'd ever let preach, and I had very little experience. But I went for the interview, and the man who interviewed me wasn't a believer, knew nothing about the situation. He assumed I was a theological student because my friend who had had the job for five years before was a theological student. I told him such and such, told me about it. I'm a student at McGill. He said, do you preach? I said, yes, I preached at my local church last week. He said, okay, you have a job. They paid me $45 a week to run the office and then $60 for the whole summer to go to the camp for the eight weeks of the camp and be there in the evenings to act like the pastor of the camp. What am I supposed to do, I said. They said, first thing you have to do is raise $25,000 to subsidize the camp. I never raised a cent in my life and didn't know what to do, and so forth. My years at the Montreal Star trained me in fundraising, in uh, working with people, in public relations, in all sorts of things that I had never, could never have gotten just for my university education. It was a remarkable job, and I stayed in that position for five years. And my whole orientation in life changed. And following that, I went on to study social work because I realized that I wanted to give my life to serving people, particularly poor and needy people. It was a remarkable training thing. Later on, as I headed up the university work in Egypt, we need to raise funds. I was young, but I had a lot of experience in fundraising. So I knew a bit about it. I needed experience in administration. I had experience in administration. I knew about office work. I knew about receipts. I knew about a lot of different things, finances, budgets. I had learned all for fresh at home, and that's why I could lead the, um, the InterVarsity work. When I went to Egypt many years later and headed up the Bible Society of Egypt, which is the largest publisher of Arabic Bibles in the world, we now have about 220 staff, we have 17 bookshops, we have lots of warehouses, vehicles. It's a very big operation. The years I spent at the Fresh Air Home, the training I had there was a basis for what I did. But also my training in InterVarsity to be concerned to reach out to the whole campus to be able to share the gospel with everybody on campus gave me a vision to share the gospel, to share the Bible with everyone in Egypt. And there's many, many things we did in our outreach uh, in Egypt that came from the seeds that were planted in me when I was a student at McGill, thinking of reaching the whole campus of 14,000 students. When I came to Egypt, I had to think of reaching a country of 100 million people, but it was the same principles, the same vision that I had. So every experience you have can help prepare you for a future you do not know today, but you will know when you get to it. Do the best where you are. Trust him to turn tragedies, obstacles into opportunities. When I joined the Bible side of Egypt, the people told me, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that. We decided that every obstacle we would turn into an opportunity, that every closed door for every closed door, we would look for a window and jump in through the window. There's always a way of doing something, if there's a will. And God helped us in tremendous ways to have an impact on the whole country, ways we couldn't have imagined when we became. Remember that your circumstances should never define you. It's how you react to them that defines you. And Joseph is a brilliant example of this. We are called to be faithful, not successful. Leave success to God and be faithful to him. After each main presentation by our speakers, we're going to have just a short time for you to meet in your impact groups. For those of you that are watching online and perhaps by yourself, there will be questions on the screen that we will ask you to consider. And perhaps you can write down a few answers and just take notes on your response to what you've heard. And impact leaders, um, we're going to take the next 10 minutes to do that. The questions will be on screen. There'll be a countdown timer. And at the end, um, I'll come back up. So here are the questions.
Okay, there's been great discussion here in Kirk Chapel, and trust you and your impact group or you just by yourself has been able to consider you know, the questions that were there and the result of thinking about the life of Joseph. Um, I was just talking to someone over here, and you, know, you don't often think about you know, how long of a span was it between the time uh, when Joseph was first sold into slavery to the time that he figured out that this was what God had intended for him and so was content with it. You're sold into slavery, then you become a prisoner. You know, it could be years and years of wondering where is God, but God was on the move. And so, good words for us to consider.